The term existentialism was coined about 30 years ago, initially mainly to refer to a couple of German philosophers about whom I shall talk hardly at all in the series of three lectures, namely Karl Jaspers and Martin Heidegger. It was, however, only after World War II that through the writings of the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, existentialism became very well known and very much talked about all over the world and quite especially in the United States too. Although there is a good deal of interest in it and it's very much discussed, there is no complete disagree there's no complete agreement about just what existentialism means, about just what it refers to. It might be foolish for me to say here is what exactly it means, but it is surely essential for me if I want to give three lectures about it to tell you how I am going to use the term. I'm going to use it as a label to refer to a number of people who are usually meant by the term, and these would be quite particularly Søren Kierkegaard and Heidegger, and Jaspers, and Jean-Paul Sartre. I'll say something about Nietzsche in a few minutes, seeing that the second lecture will be largely devoted to Nietzsche. Now, why use the term existentialism as such a label, instead of using the word, rather giving a clear-cut definition of it? There's one existentialist who tried to give a definition of it. Sartre said that existentialism was the doctrine that teaches that existence precedes essence. There are a number of things that are bad about this definition. The first one is, and this in itself isn't crucial, that it's terribly unclear. That it's even harder to understand what it means that existence precedes essence than it's to understand, quite apart from that, what existentialism might be. The second reason for not accepting this definition, which after all perhaps could be explained, is that no sooner had Sartre said that in a lecture, existentialism is a humanism, then Heidegger published a letter on humanism in which he said, if that's existentialism, I'm not an existentialist. And along came Jaspers and said, count me out too. <laughs> and if we look back, for example, to Kierkegaard, for example, to Nietzsche, or if we take a sidelong glance at Camus, it seems clear that these other men would not accept this particular definition either. Now, one might see, is there some other definition that we can impose on the lot of them? And it doesn't seem to me to be a particularly fruitful undertaking. We might perhaps later in this course of lectures look back afterwards and see whether some one definition comes to mind. Meanwhile, I don't have a bad conscience at all about just using it as such a label. There are any number of other labels that we use in a similar way. For example, when we speak of American pragmatism, what are we doing but simply using some sort of shorthand device to refer all at once to Peirce and James and Dewey, perhaps also to me, perhaps also to one or another person who comes to mind. But we don't work with any very clear-cut definition, and if we happen to be close students of any two of these men, say of James and Dewey or of James and Peirce, then the more we read them, the more we become aware of the fact that they really don't agree with each other at all, that they are very important points on which they disagree with each other. And still it's useful sometimes to discuss them together because there are some family resemblances between them. There are certain ways in which they belong recognizably together rather than belong with other groups. Similarly, when we speak of continental rationalists, as we sometimes do in philosophy courses, then we mean 
Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz, and as we study them, we find that they violently disagreed with each other on points that mattered deeply to them. I'll just give one more such example, example namely British empiricism. Another such label, it refers to Locke, Barclay, and Hume, and if we examine them closely, we find, for example, that Locke was a deist, that Barclay was a bishop, and that Hume was, to be polite about it, an agnostic. So there were certainly very many things about which these three disagreed with each other, and they criticized each other, and still there are some things that Locke, Barclay, and Hume sort of seem to have in common, even if it's a little difficult to say what precisely it is, and that distinguishes them from the rationalists or from the pragmatists. So there's nothing unusual about using the term existentialism as a label for a group of people and then sort of as an afterthought asking ourselves, now what are the traits that they have in common? Now the traits that they have in common are, first of all, that the men that we usually call existentialists are all of them very radical individualists. And this is what makes it so hard to pin them all down to a common platform. They're all men who have very much a mind of their own and to make a point of going it alone. In fact, part of whose common outlook is that there is something wrong with schools of philosophy, that there is something wrong with drafting some kind of a platform, that there is something wrong with philosophic systems. They are people who, in a phrase that Nietzsche once used in Saratustra, like only what a man has written with his blood. In other words, stuff that doesn't come from the brain alone, but rather stuff in which a man is engaged as an entire personality with all his experience. This is the sort of thing they like. And if a man tries to transpose into prose all of his experience, then seeing that his experience and his character is bound to be different from somebody else's, there will be a distinctive individual quality to his writing which distinguishes him from the other men. And so, as we take up in these three lectures, three different men, we will find that everyone has very much a style of his own and a character of his own and a mode of thinking of his own. Positively, we can say that one further thing that they have in common is a concern with extreme situations, extreme experiences, the most intense experiences, the most extraordinary experiences, and in the narrower sense, we might say the less happy experiences. And it's in a narrower sense, this leaves out to some extent Nietzsche, who is certainly a borderline figure, a very doubtful candidate for existentialism. What he has in common with the other existentialists is that he too is particularly interested in ultimate experiences, but unlike most of the other existentialists, he does not emphasize so exclusively, to cite the titles of some of Kierkegaard's books, Fear and Trembling, and the sickness unto death which is despair, and the concept of dread, and going beyond Kierkegaard now, the experience of the anticipation in thought of one's own death. On the whole, the existentialists are particularly preoccupied with the gloomier experiences, but at any rate, with the most dramatic, with the most tragic experiences. This, of course, in large measure, accounts for the intelligent person's interest in existentialism and accounts for the fact that even people who find most current philosophy not particularly interesting feel that when it comes to existentialism, there is something here that's of concern to them because existentialists do talk about experiences about which it is difficult to be indifferent experiences that matter to all of us and that engage our interest if they are written about with any sensitivity and intelligence at all.
What is implicit in what I have said so far is that if the question is raised, for example, was Pascal an existentialist or was Albert Camus an existentialist, there is no right or wrong answer here. All we can say is, well, there are certain things that these men have in common with people usually called existentialists, and then we can see are there also some things that, distingu that distinguish them from the other existentialists? In what respects are they like other members of the family? In what respects are they different? Certainly we must not make up our minds on the basis of whether they like each other. It so happens that most of the living existentialists dislike each other quite intensely, but that happens in some families too, and that's no proof that somebody doesn't belong to the family. On the contrary, precisely people who have much in common with each other and who have inherited some of the same traits sometimes find each other particularly trying. And that applies to existentialists too. A further implication of what I have said is that it would not be proper to say that existentialism is a synonym for modern philosophy. There are some modern philosophers, especially French and German ones, though not only French and German ones, who are existentialists, but there are also many other modern philosophers, including most modern English-speaking philosophers, who are not existentialists. The existentialists are those who share these traits that I have talked about, who are so individualistic, who are impatient with things that are remote from life, who deal with dramatic experiences. Now, how shall we relate existentialism to what I have called the modern crisis? That there are all sorts of crises in our time is surely not controversial. Unquestionably, our time is a time of crisis. But I do not mean to imply right from the start, without having examined the matter at all, that our time is uniquely a time of crisis. About this I would like temporarily to suspend judgment. So if one or the other of you would feel that perhaps every time is a time of crisis, or at least that there have been many other times that have been just as critical as our time, we needn't uh, argue about this at all. We needn't have any difference about this at all. All that I want to say is that there are some crises in our time, and what I want to do is to relate existentialism to three such crises in our time, the one in religion today, the one in philosophy next week, the one in morality two weeks from today, and then we can see each time to what extent each of these three crises is uniquely modern or to what extent it is perhaps a perpetual crisis. Now, why do I pick out the three men that I have picked out? Kierkegaard for today, Nietzsche for next week, and Sartre for two weeks from tonight. First of all, there are strong reasons for beginning with Kierkegaard because he is the first unquestionable existentialist. He is the one who started the whole modern movement of existentialism, even though now in retrospect we can look further back and find existentialist features in the thought of Pascal or even St. Augustine, or as some people would like to do all the way back in the book of Job. Still, as a philosophic and literary movement, existentialism starts with Kierkegaard. Moreover, Kierkegaard is undoubtedly one of the most commanding and impressive figures of existentialism, and I think of the religious existentialists probably the most remarkable. So he is, to my mind, a particularly good and I would say obvious choice for discussing religious existentialism. The international renown of existentialism is largely due to Jean-Paul Sartre, 
And I would say that if we look at literary representatives of existentialism, Sartre is probably the outstanding one, the one who in brilliant novels, short stories, plays and essays, as well as philosophic treatises, has brought existentialism to our attention. And here too, in the case of Sartre, just as in the case of Kierkegaard, I am influenced by my considerable respect for the man. Nietzsche was not, as I have already remarked, strictly speaking, in the narrow sense of the word, an existentialist, but I think a good case can be made out for saying that he towers very far indeed above such philosophers as Jaspers and Heidegger, perhaps even to the extent of being the last world historical philosopher, by which I mean that since Nietzsche's time, philosophers have not had a really international impact. A man like Sartre, a man like Jaspers, a man like Heidegger has had very little impact on English-speaking philosophy. On the other hand, the giants of English-speaking philosophy, people like Russell and Moore and John Dewey and William James, have had hardly any impact in the non-English-speaking world on continental European thought. Nietzsche is, I think, the last great philosopher in whom we find impulses and tendencies that have been influential and crucially important for philosophy almost everywhere. So I pick him too because he seems to me to be of unusual stature. To wind up then these introductory remarks, I would say that I happen to be, as some of you know, critical of existentialism, but the point of this series of three lectures will not be to tear down existentialism. It will not be to try to show how foolish it all is. And that is why I have picked three men to whom in various ways, although I am critical of them here or there, I do look up. And what I want to do is to try to increase your understanding as best I can not only of these three men, but also of existentialism, and beyond that, of some aspects of the modern world, of three crises in particular, of issues that concern all of us, and perhaps here and there I may be able to make some constructive suggestions. Now let us begin with Kierkegaard. I propose to approach him somewhat differently from the way he is usually approached. I think he himself would have said that the usual approach to his thought is, in his own peculiar use of that word, aesthetic. When Kierkegaard speaks of an aesthetic approach, or an aesthetic orientation, what he means is that one is a spectator, that one looks at something that is outside oneself, that one observes without becoming involved in it. An extreme form of an aesthetic attitude would be if you collapse in front of your TV set and just try to be entertained. But that would not be the only example of an aesthetic attitude. The attitude would remain aesthetic, the way Kierkegaard uses the term, as long as you make no commitment, as long as you yourself do not become deeply involved. And I dare say that most current interpretations of and most current interest in Kierkegaard is of this aesthetic nature, that he is a terribly interesting person. Being interesting would be, in Kierkegaard's peculiar use of the term, an aesthetic category. It's interesting. It's fascinating. Just look at it. Secondly, people usually look at Kierkegaard by way of pointing out that he was very critical of the German philosopher Hegel. 
And since there's hardly anybody who is not very critical of Hegel, if he talks about Hegel at all, this too is not very distinctive. To say he is interesting, to say he hates Hegel's guts, this really doesn't set him apart. Almost everybody does. Thirdly, people usually present Kierkegaard as if he had been something of an apologist either an apologist for Christianity or preferably a sort of non-denominational apologist for religion. Somebody who sort of fits into the current scene as one of the many people who are, of course, as who is not in favor of religion. In all three respects, my approach to Kierkegaard is very different. First of all, it's not aesthetic, but existential. Instead of just saying, now, isn't he a beautiful writer? Doesn't he put things quaintly? Isn't this a nice book? I will say, isn't this a maddening book? Isn't this something that is meant to upset us? Kierkegaard uses deliberately the uh, word that is found in the epistles of Paul, scandalon, a scandal, a stumbling block, an outrage, something that is upsetting. Kierkegaard wants to upset us, and I will try to emphasize elements in his thought that are upsetting. This takes me to the second point. Instead of claiming that he criticized Hegel, which he certainly did, I will say that he criticized Hegel and Hegelianism because philosophers in his time, for the most part, were Hegelians, but that he really criticized philosophy quite generally, and that if he had lived in our time, instead of picking on poor old Hegel, I'm sure he would have picked on pragmatism, or he would have picked on uh, logical positivism, or analytic philosophy, any kind of philosophy, indeed beyond philosophy, he would have criticized our trust in reason, our trust in science. This is something that is, to the modern mind, somewhat outrageous, but this is something that has to be brought out. And finally, very far from being an apologist for Christianity or for religion, somebody who tries to make it palatable, Kierkegaard wore himself out in trying to denounce people who sought to make religion and Christianity in particular palatable and insisted that it is not palatable but that it is absolutely absurd, that it's outrageous to the human reason, that it might even outrage our moral sense and that nevertheless it should be accepted. In other words, his conception of religion, once it is understood, I think, is seen not to fit at all into the current revival of religion, but on the contrary, Kierkegaard, if he were living today, I'm sure, would be a particularly outspoken and radical critic of the kind of religion that is flourishing today. And this wants to be brought out if one wants to do justice to the man who said of himself in what is perhaps one of the nicest passages of his writings, that when he was about 30, one day he sat in the park and he said to himself, here I am 30 years old and what have I done? Very, very little. Here are so many great men in our time and they all have done so much and I have done so little. And then he thought about it and he decided that what all these men were doing to the best of their ability was to make life easier and that he himself had no talent for making life easier, and so he resolved to make things more difficult. <laughs> I think that's a lovely passage in the concluding unscientific postscript, how Kierkegaard resolves to make things more difficult. And one doesn't do justice to him and his heritage if one talks about him for an hour in a lecture, if one doesn't bring out this crucial element that he is somebody who related himself to Socrates because he too wanted to be a gadfly. He too wanted to make things difficult. Now let me very quickly fill in some data about his life. He was born in 1813, and he died in 1855, and he lived almost all his life in Denmark, specifically in Copenhagen, though he briefly studied also at the University of Berlin. 
His father was a very strict and rigid authoritarian, a very pious man who was bothered by the fact that once when he had been very poor as a young boy, he had out on the heather cursed God. And this bothered not only the father, but it also bothered the son very deeply. Kierkegaard also remembers how his father wouldn't uh, allow him much to go outdoors, but said uh, there's no need to go outdoors. Perhaps this had something to do with the fact that the boy, Zoran Kierkegaard, was somewhat crippled, somewhat misshapen. Perhaps that was why the father didn't want him to go out too much. The father said, we can take a walk in this room. We can just walk up and down together. And as they walked up and down together for perhaps half an hour at a time, the father described what they saw. Castles in Spain, and he described them in such great detail, everything that they saw, and with such painstaking and vivid imagination, that after about half an hour the boy was all worn out from so much experience and as exhausted as if he had been playing ball for hours. This greatly stimulated his imagination, but also made him something very peculiar, somewhat solipsistic, somebody who could sort of after a while just stay by himself and imagine all sorts of things without ever actually coming into contact with other people. Then one day it seemed to the young boy that there was strong evidence that his father had seduced his mother before they were married when the father's first wife had died and when the second wife-to-be was still a maid in his house and that he, Zoran Kierkegaard, was probably begotten before his father and mother were married. And when he found this out, he was so shocked because his father had seemed such a pious and such a moral man that it would seem that just once he debauched himself, he went to a brothel, something of that sort, and then afterwards kept thinking about the relation between the sins of the fathers and the sins of the children, how somehow the father's sin was connected, as it obviously was psychologically in his case, with the sin of the son, who when he finds out about the father's sin, does something himself, it is sinful, and this set him to brooding about original sin. Not that he wouldn't have thought about that anyway, but there was this vivid personal connection in, this, uh, in his mind. And then he became engaged to a young girl, a very young girl, Regina, and finally decided that he couldn't go through with a marriage, and he felt that he couldn't say to her, I ha have some kind of a call. I think marriage might interfere with the sort of things that I have to do. Or he couldn't say to her, being somewhat crippled, I feel that I just can't consummate our marriage. I, I, I don't really want to get married. He felt that he couldn't be frank with her because she was so young. He felt that he couldn't share these awful memories of what his father had done, what he had done with her. And so he felt that perhaps the only way of bringing this unhappy relationship to an end was to lead her to want to break off the engagement by seeming to be a terribly frivolous person, blackening his own character so that he would want to break off the relationship. And here I have given you the major events of his life. These relatively few experiences not in themselves perhaps really so terribly unusual, were for him fateful experiences that with an unusually sensitive soul he brooded over all his short life long and kept alluding to in one way or another in his many, many books. There are, I think, only two further episodes in his life to be added to round out the picture. 
One, which I find particularly moving, is that there was a paper in Copenhagen that praised him highly, that took a fancy to him. He was a brilliant writer, and a writer with a fine sense of humor, and a good stylist, and the paper praised him. And Kierkegaard despised this paper. And so he wrote the paper and said that he counted it a dishonor to be praised in its pages, and that in view of his opinion of this paper, he would much rather be pilloried by it. And the editor, perhaps understandably, took offense at this and ran in almost every issue horribly merciless cartoons of the misshapen, crippled Kierkegaard, making fun of him all the time until the children ran after him in the streets and threw rocks at him and laughed at him. But here you have a contempt for popularity and a contempt for the things that most people appreciate that I think requires a very profound respect. The other thing about his life that I still want to mention is that in the very end he came to the conclusion that the church of his country, which happened to be Lutheran, was so antithetical to what he took to be true Christianity and the heritage of Christ that he felt that one must openly protest against it. And so he privately printed pamphlets against the church, peddled them on the streets, collapsed in the street in the process of peddling them, was carried into a hospital where he lingered between life and death for a short while, refused to take the sacraments from an ordained minister of his church, said he would be willing to take them from a layman, but no layman was allowed to give him the sacraments. And so, although devoutly, intensely, passionately Christian, died without having taken the sacraments because he would not compromise with a church that he considered a betrayal of true religion. His books are exceedingly plentiful, and there's a point to be made about them. In the year 1843, for example, he published Either Or in two volumes, then in the same year, 18 edifying discourses, then in the same year, a book called Repetition, and then still in the same year, Fear and Trembling. You might think that having published more than five volumes in one year, that he might have rested up during the following year, but in 1844 he published his philosophical fragments, his concept of dread and another book. And in 1845, an enormous book, Stages on Life's Way. In, eight, in 1846, his perhaps most ambitious work, Concluding Unscientific Postscript. In 1847, more edifying discourses and his great works of love. In 1848, he wrote a book that he didn't publish. In 1849, he published The Sickness Unto Death, as well as three other books, and also completed two more books that he didn't publish that year, and that were published posthumously, and so it went. Here was a man, in other words, who wore himself out writing what he had to say, who did not divide his energies among any other things, though he had taken a theological degree. He did not become a minister. He did not want to have any official connection with the church and just wrote, wrote, wrote at a feverish pace. Under the circumstances, it is perhaps not a carping criticism if I say that sometimes his writing is, leaves something to be desired from a philosophic point of view, that sometimes it is not as careful as it might be, that sometimes there are perhaps turns of phrase uh, that invite objections, that sometimes perhaps he contradicts himself, that sometimes one can't find fault. 
After all, if one writes at such a pace, so many books, not just in one year, but year after year after year, it is obvious that not everything is polished and as well considered as it might be. It has often been said, rightly, that Kierkegaard engaged in what is called indirect communication. And what is usually meant by that is that most of the books that I have just mentioned were not published over the name of Søren Kierkegaard, but over the name of rather odd, usually Latin pseudonyms. They were published by people with outrageous names. It was always obvious, because these names were Latin, that they couldn't be the real people. But all Copenhagen in those days was discussing, were all these pseudonyms one and the same man, or were they all sorts of different people? And Kierkegaard added to the mystification by having some pseudonyms attack others. And their cross-references in these books, and this tickled his sense of humor. He thought this was funny. It is mildly funny, and this is called indirect communication. I don't think that that is really the heart of Kierkegaard's indirect communication. This is something that one might explain to some extent psychologically. One might say, isn't this continuous with what I told you about these walks that he took with his father, that here he, all alone in one room, peopled the world the way Richard II does in prison. All the world, the stage for him. And here are all these characters, all his inventions, and they engage in fights, and on some points they agree, and on some they disagree. You might almost say, say, without being disrespectful, this perhaps is part of his pathology. This is something that's psychologically odd and interesting, but this, I think, is not the crucial part of his indirect communication. The crucial part of the indirect communication is that Kierkegaard's mode of expression is artistic, that instead of always writing edifying discourses, as he sometimes did, instead of always coming right out and preaching, he often does the sort of thing that a novelist or a playwright does, that a man like Sartre will do too, namely, who avails himself of the mode of literature, of the mode of art, to get across his ideas a little less directly than one would if one came right out and told the reader. There are other features of a style that I think there's no need to go into in any detail here. It is, I think, an exasperating style, an outrageous style, an offensive style, and means to be so. To retell the story that in Genesis takes less than one full page about how Abraham went out to sacrifice Isaac but then didn't, Kierkegaard takes a whole little book going over and over and over it again with variations. And he means to exasperate, he means to annoy, he means to upset, he does not mean just to entertain. In fact, that whole little book, Fear and Trembling, is directed against people who read Genesis and find it oh so interesting and oh so admirable and don't ask themselves, What would I say if a man came along in my time who said, God has told me to sacrifice somebody else and I am about to do it? This is the problem that Kierkegaard says we must ask ourselves about. We mustn't say, isn't it a beautiful story and how well written and uh, how concise in style and look how the emotions of father and son are caught so beautifully. That is an aesthetic approach. What Kierkegaard wants is the existential approach that asks, what would I do if I were in Abraham's shoes? What would I do if my next-door neighbor said that he was in Abraham's shoes and went out to kill somebody else because he thought that God had told him to? Now, what about the crisis in religion? to which I want to relate Kierkegaard. The crisis in religion in our time is so manifold 
that one could easily, obviously, give more than three lectures without even mentioning Kierkegaard just to analyze the crisis in religion. I will single out instead three aspects of the crisis in religion. One, because I think they are important, and two, because I think that Kierkegaard is interesting in relation to them. The first crisis in religion in our time, and I think perhaps the single most important point is one that may strike you at first as being such old hat that it's hardly worth talking about. And that is the way in which science has undermined what we might call naive religious beliefs. Now you, for the most part, may consider this terribly old hat because you may feel that the beliefs that have been undermined by science are so naive that you obviously don't have these beliefs anymore. But for a moment, do just recapitulate in your own mind the familiar enough story of how beginning, say, with Copernicus and going on to Galileo and to Darwin and to Freud, again and again science has come into conflict with religion and has forced religious people to reinterpret their beliefs, to revise their beliefs. 